All right, I'd like to introduce tonight's speakers. Kelsey Malloy is a rangeland ecologist and she joined the Nature Conservancy in April of 2017. She received a BS in wildlife biology at the University of Rhode Island and a master's of natural resources management from the University of Manitoba. Prior to joining the conservancy, Kelsey worked for the Soil and Water Conservation Districts of Montana as part of the Sage Grouse Initiative. Um, she's also an active member of Montana Native Plant Society, having led uh, field trips at the Matador Ranch. And during the pandemic, you may have caught some of Kelsey's great uh, wildflower walk videos that she shared um, on Facebook. Brian Martin is the Montana Grasslands Conservation Director for TNC, and he's worked for the Nature Conservancy for more than 30 years. Brian manages the Conservancy's protection, science, and stewardship efforts in the grasslands of Eastern Montana. He received a BS in range science from North Dakota State University and an MS in range science from New Mexico State University. And I would be remiss if I uh, didn't mention that in 2017, the Montana Native Plant Society awarded Brian a Lifetime Achievement Award for his outstanding work in conservation. Um, with that, you can take it away, Kelsey and Brian. If you want to share your screen there, Kelsey? All right. Ah, there we go. Okay. Thank you so much for having me tonight. It's so nice to get a chance to talk about native plants with people and see all these uh, fami familiar names. And um, hopefully if the wind doesn't blow you away tonight, the presentation will. <laughs> um, so we broke our presentation into two components. So first I'm going to talk about um, grassland ecology generally, and then specifically in Montana. Um, with a focus on native plants, even though there's uh, so many cool parts of grassland ecology. And then Brian and I will talk about um, some of the conservation going on in Montana around grasslands. So um, just to start with, I wanted to give an overview of grasslands in North America. Oops, sorry. Um, so this map kind of shows where grasslands historically would have been the dominant landscape. Um, a lot of these, as you can imagine, are no longer in existence. So for example, there's less than 0.1% of the tall grass prairie remaining. And that is in line with what we've seen um, globally with grasslands, that they are a habitat type that has um, some of the highest conversion rates as well as some of the lowest protection rates. So um, they're definitely globally of concern. Um, another thing I wanted to point out on this map is that it has the yellow as mixed grass prairie. And depending on what map you look at and who you talk to, um, some people have that be a wider range, so I would typically consider, consider Montana to be more mixed grass prairie. Um, but so these, these areas, especially there in the middle, that's, you know, what we consider the Great Plains where grasslands are the, the dominant landscape. And uh, one of the things that shapes grasslands, obviously they're landscapes that um, the dominant vegetation is grass. And so climate and precipitation is a big driver. So as you get past about 30 inches of rain a year, you start seeing deciduous forests instead of grasslands. And at that edge, um, there's can be issues with tree encroachment and um, that's where you need fire and, fire and grazing to keep that at bay. And then below uh, eight or nine inches a year, and then you get into more of a desert landscape. So grasslands by their nature um, fluctuate a lot year to year because they're ecosystems that are shaped by disturbance. So um, I'm just gonna highlight some of the key drivers here. So one of those is fire. Historically, indigenous peoples use those as a tool and would set fires. And uh, fires are also started by lightning. Um, the further east you were, the more frequent your fire return interval would have been. Um, now in the current landscape, um, there is much less of a fire culture, depending on where you are, and a lot of wildfires are suppressed. So in many ways, that driver has been mostly removed from the landscape. Um, then in the bottom, I have that image of a little storm. Um, 
as I mentioned, precipitation is a big driver um, because it keeps um, it keeps it dry enough that grasses flourish and trees don't. Um, but it also means that every plant and animal that lives here has to be able to adapt to fairly dry conditions. So there's a lot of different ways that they do that. And I'll talk about some of those um, in a little bit. In the Northern Great Plains, most of our precipitation comes in April, May, and June, um, and usually in smaller showers. Um, although with climate change, we can expect to see more extreme weather events. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind that in areas where you have more precipitation happening in the winter instead, they tend to be sagebrush or um, shrub dominated landscapes instead of grass dominated landscapes. And then of course the big driver is herbivory. And so that can take many forms from things like the grasshopper outbreak that we saw this year, um, which tends to be more uh, infrequent kind of random events with grasshoppers moving unevenly across the landscape, um, as well as um, mammals like rabbits, antelope, deer, elk, and historically bison. So um, now most of our rangeland systems are both public and private are used for domestic livestock, um, primarily cattle. Um, the end result though is that grazing pressure can help shape the habitat. So, you know, some, some plant species are more or less resistant to grazing. And um, just looking at it from a wildlife habitat perspective, a lot of the species that live here are adapted to some level of grazing. Um, and they will actually, especially birds, move to seek out areas that have the habitat structure that they desire. And so for some species like mountain plovers, that's like 30% bare ground, very little grass. And then at the other end of the spectrum, things like bird sparrow need a lot of grass. And so um, grazing can be a tool to create what that structure looks like in the grasslands. And so in Montana, we are extremely lucky um, because we do still have some large intact grassland landscapes. So a lot of our species um, are only found in areas with like really big grassland landscapes, like not 40 acres, not 60 acres, not 200 acres, but like hundreds of thousands of acres of grass. So um, because we have that large intact landscape, we actually have um, animals migrating across borders, which I think is super cool that our grasslands here, the health of our grasslands is tied to the health of grasslands in Mexico and Canada. So um, sage grouse and pronghorn antelope migrate from Saskatchewan and Alberta into Montana in the winter. And then our grassland bird species, which we have the highest species richness of grassland bird species in the country. Um, a lot of those birds fly south to Mexico and some like swains and hawks even go all the way to Argentina. So um, our, we really have like an international grassland community going on. And we have the second largest sage grass population. Um, and so because we have this intact grassland, we still have a lot of these um, large, large migrations and large populations present. And so I just like to show this map to show, you know, I. I definitely, if you know me, have a bias towards birds, <laughs> but there is one mammal on here too. Um, so the, uh, the blue on here shows uh, breeding habitat for, or areas of high um, duck nesting. And so you can see all across the highland of Montana, that is important habitat for those ducks. The green is the um, pronghorn corridors as they move down from Canada. The gray is the sage grouse core areas, and then the yellow are the high density areas for grassland songbirds. So um, all these different species are relying on those intact grassland ecosystems. And I'm just touching on like a small portion of things here. Of course, we have prairie dogs and badgers and salamanders and a whole host of other things, but I can't touch on all of them today. Um, oh, I did put in one more bird slide. <laughs> um, just to emphasize again, you know, looking at the large scale. Um, of course, a lot of these birds population is in Canada, but then when you look at the US, especially for thick-billed longspur and Sprague's pipit, a big chunk of their population in the US is found in Montana. Um, 
And so again, these birds need native grass and they need large, um, large undisturbed habitats. Um, so another important thing I want to point out before we got into um, the plants is that even though I think of grass as being the foundation of the ecosystem, actually soil is the foundation of the ecosystem underneath that. And one of the reasons from a conservation perspective that grasslands are so important is that they store a lot of carbon and the carbon they store um, is very stable because most of it's below ground and very old carbon. So if you look at something like a forest, it could burn or the trees could be cut down and then some of that carbon is released. A grassland, as long as it stays intact, most of the carbon, up to 85% of it is stable carbon because it's um, stored below ground and that's where the majority of it is stored. So this is um, in kilograms per hectare, but it's showing you know, at the, within the first couple inches of the soil where you have active um, soil microbes and decomposition going on, you have a very small portion of the carbon stocks compared to what's um, lower down in the soil. So some of that carbon is a couple hundred or a thousand years old. Um, so when we lose prairies because they're plowed up, like almost immediately you're losing half of those carbon stocks. So from a climate change and carbon storage perspective, grasslands are also super important. So because this is a native plant group, I of course, and I'm a native plant nerd, I wanted to focus on some of the different types of native plants and just kind of go through um, some of those groups and highlight a couple facts and a couple plants that I like. I basically just went through my pictures and <laughs> found pictures of, of the ones that I like the most. Um, so of course, grasses are our dominant species. There's over 200 species of grass in Montana. So I only chose five to talk about tonight, but there's a lot of them. Um, and if you haven't done grass ID before, it can be difficult at first, but ends up being very rewarding. Um, so this first, first one in the top left corner is needle and thread grass. And depending on where you are, there can be quite a bit of it. For our Canadian folks, that's the provincial grass of Saskatchewan. Um, in the top right corner is June grass. So um, I realized actually when I put these up here, all of the grasses I put up here are bunch grasses. So as the name suggests they grow in a bunch. The other type of grass is rhizomatous. So that's things like thick spike wheatgrass or western wheatgrass or plains reed grass, where you have one individual stalk coming up and then there's a rhizome, which is a modified root. Um, underground and then coming up from that is another piece of grass. So those are two different um, strategies for grasses here. In the bottom corner, I have a somewhat blurry picture of blue bunch wheatgrass, the seed head. So that is Montana's state grass. And you can all impress your friends when you see it and can identify it properly um, because the ons um, come out from the seed head at a 90 degree angle. So that's a key identification piece. No, I haven't impressed anybody with it yet, but Maybe you guys can. <laughs> um, in the middle is green needlegrass, Nacella virigula. That is one of my favorites. It's um, a little bit bigger than some of the other grasses and greener and just, I just am always happy to see it. Um, and this grass is a great indicator grass I think of because it is something that cattle favor. So I use it as a good um, rangeland health indicator if I'm looking at a place to see, well, how is this plant? plant doing. Um, and then in the bottom corner is blue gramma grass. Um, some people call it the eyelash grass if you look at the, the shape of the seed head. And that grass, unlike the other ones here, is a warm season grass. So it, uh, because we're, you know, in these northern climes, most of our grass species are cool season grasses, which can start growing as early as April. And then, but we do have a couple species like blue gramma grass, uh, little blue stem, sand drop seed that favor those warmer conditions and will grow later in the year. So um, for those of you who know me, I'm not always the biggest fan of trees. I don't really wanna see more than one at a time, but they are a component of the prairie ecosystem too. So um, they do need more soil moisture than you know, what we would typically typically get through rainfall. So we usually see them in 
uh, woody draws along roadsides where there's extra moisture in the ditches and then in riparian areas. So one of the most common ones is um, the cottonwood tree, Populus deltoides. And um, those are, can grow to be fairly large trees. They're also somewhat short-lived compared to, well, compared to like some of your forest trees that they usually die at about a hundred years. And uh, they have very particular requirements um, to establish a stand of trees. And so there are some concerns in our um, prairie riparian areas that they're declining. In the top corner, there's a photo of buffalo berry, um, which is a native shrub that um, has what, what I think are delicious berries. They're pretty tart though. <laughs> I think the, the birds like them too. And then in the bottom is what I'm 90% sure is a box elder tree, um, but trees are not my strong point. And as I was looking at it, I was like, maybe it's something else. Um, <laughs> But so in riparian areas, a lot of times we have box elder trees, um, sometimes the willows, like peach leaved willow and the um, sandbar willow, occasionally green ash. Um, so trees in small numbers play an important part as they're nesting and perch sites for birds like birds of prey and orioles and stuff. Um, but we don't wanna see too many because then they start to become a deterrent for other species on the plains. Um, then we have the shrub component, which at least when you're in the northern grasslands, there's a fairly small, small component of the landscape. Um, and a lot of them, you know, I call them shrubs, but they are quite small. So on the um, left, that yellow flower is broom snakeweed, Scuderesia serrathrae. And um, those can vary in size, but sometimes you see them and they're like, you know, five or six inches tall. They can get bigger too, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's not what you stereotypically think of as a shrub. And a lot of our shrubs flower in the fall. So they seem to be really important for pollinators at that time of year when most of the other floral resources are gone. Um, in the middle is winter fat. Uh, the scientific name is Crescenta nanocovia lanata, which is quite a mouthful, but kind of fun to say. Um, and so that one is really favored by browsing and grazing animals because it has um, high protein, especially in the winter when they're looking for that. So hence the name winter fat. Um, so I took a picture of that one because it was so big because usually you don't see them um, quite that large. And then on the far side is um, golden current, Ribes or am. And um, I've been noticing, so I, I'm just putting this out there in case anybody has any ideas? I've been noticing when I go out to pick them occasionally that they come in yellow, black, and red varieties. I don't, I don't know why it is. It's the same species. So if anyone has insight, let me know. Um, and then there's some other shrub species like wild rose, uh, rabbit brush, snowberry that are um, part of the landscape too and, and, and are important for some of the um, more shrub nesting species. Oh, and of course, sagebrush. Can't forget those. Um, then this is what really brings me joy is all the wildflowers. Um, and so I just picked like five of them here, but there's, uh, even though we're not, we're not in a place like the Amazon with countless plants that nobody could ever document, but there is still a surprising amount of diversity for such a dry landscape. And, you know, when you, when you first go out and you're like, you don't think that there's going to be that much out there and you start walking around and you can find quite a few things. Um, so in the top left corner is purple prairie clover, that's Dahlia purpurea, and that's a legume, um, and it smells really nice and the bees seem to like it. Uh, in the bottom left is a prickly pear cactus, uh, Apuntia polyacantha, and um, in the middle, so I like this plant so much I actually put it in this presentation twice. Uh, this is smooth blue penstemon, penstemon nididus, and it blooms in the early spring, and I just think it is stunningly gorgeous every time. <laughs> um, in the top right, that's a Seiko lily. Um, these ones too are just gorgeous, and they seem to have, um, you know, bumper years. And then, like last year, I saw like three total. Last year being this year, you know, when we had a drought. So, drought is definitely a driver of um, diversity of plant diversity in the grasslands. And then at the bottom is 
um, blanket flower, um, Gallardi aristana. And if you want to see more wildflowers, you'll just ha have to come join me <laughs> for a wildflower walk next spring. Um, and then I had to mention, even though I don't know as much as I should about them, um, the lichen and all the um, organisms that make up the biocrust. So um, a lot of the grasslands, if you go out and walk and look down, you'll see moss, lichen, um, something we call black algae, um, club moss, which is Selaginella densa. And so those are all really important for the functioning of the ecosystem too. I actually have a lichen book and I just have not been able to figure out the lichen ID yet, but um, they are, uh, it is important to mention them. And then of course, once you get um, even below them, there's all those soil microbes that are keeping the um, ecosystem functioning too. And so before we move on to the conservation part of the talk, I did want to talk a little bit about some of the adaptations for how uh, these plants can survive in an ecosystem where it can be over 100 degrees, you could only get three inches of rain, um, you know, there might be animals trying to graze on you, grasshoppers, you know, tearing little holes in you. So there's so many different threats that they have to adapt to. And, you know, I wouldn't say that these are necessarily unique to a grassland landscape, but these are just kind of um, examples of how they play out here. So the first one is chemical compounds. And when I teach people about identifying plants in the grasslands, a lot of times I suggest that they smell the plant in their hand because a lot of our plants have really strong smells. And those can come from different chemical compounds like alkaloids, terpenes. Um, and so this here with the yellow flower is um, Hymenoxus frigidsonus, uh, which I call Colorado rubberweed. I should give the disclaimer, there's a lot of different common names. So I'm just telling you what I call them. It's not right or wrong. You might know them by a different name. Um, but if you smell it, it has a really piney smell. And there's a lot of other um, things like the Artemisia species, or if you find gumweed, that has a strong smell. Um, so it's a cool thing to help with ID, but it also has a, a, usually a biological reason to it. Um, the next uh, tool that some of these plants have is parasitism and hemiparasitism. So hemiparasitism means it's just a partial parasite. And that's what this plant in the middle is, which is the aptly named bastard toad flax or commander umbellata. So although it's able to make its own chlorophyll, it will tap into the roots of other plants and parasitize them and use some of their nutrients. Um, and so the um, grassland paintbrush that we have. And um, there's an owl clover, or Orthocarpus luteus also do that. And then we have um, a couple of species in the Orobanshi genus that are full parasites and don't have chlorophyll um, and parasitize on other plants. Um, we'd think usually uh, some of the Artemisia sagebrush species. So very sneaky adaptation. <laughs> um, oops. Then I put the cactus here. So of course, cactuses have many adaptations to living in dry climates, not just spines, but they're able to go without water for a long time and they photosynthesize in a different way. Um, but it was just a good example of spines that sometimes plants have, you know, actual hurtful armor to keep things away from them. Um, so there's four species of cactus, uh, at least that I know of in Montana, there's two pincushion species and two prickly pear species. Um, but there's other things that have spines too, like the buffalo berry I mentioned earlier, um, greasewood, shad scale salt bush. Um, you know, if you've ever touched a thistle, those have smaller things. So they're not, I mean, they're not 100% effective for say cattle grazing. You'll still, you'll still see cattle graze on uh, canda thistle or greasewood sometimes, um, but it is something of a defense mechanism or can be against that. Um, I also, I guess over the last couple of years, have started thinking a lot more about pollination and basically I'm just in total awe of how pollination happens and still don't understand a lot of it. But one, um, really cool example of how, um, plants can photo or not photosynthesize, pollinate is, um, symbiosis where like 
with the yucca plants here, uh, which is sometimes called soapweed, it's the scientific name of yucca glauca, there is a moth that comes and pollinates it. And then that same moth comes and lays its eggs in the pods of the yucca plant. So they're both getting a service where the yucca plant is getting um, its seeds developed, and then it's giving up some of those seed pods um, to make a home for the, the yucca moth um, larva. So if you go out and look at, at yucca pods, which I did this fall, you, you can find ones with the little holes in them where uh, presumably a yucca moth or some other insect was um, making its home in there. Um, then another adaptation to uh, drought and heat are um, having waxy leaves or having hairs on leaves. And you'll see in our grassland ecosystem, a lot of plants have more of a grayish or silvery color because they have lots of hairs on them. And those hairs can help, um, depending on how thick they are, reflect uh, heat and prevent some evaporation. And then similarly, the waxy leaves can do that too. So um, this flower, or sorry, the flower with the, the white is um, shaggy fleabane. And then the flower with the blue flowers, I said earlier was smooth blue penstemon, but another name for it is wax-leaved penstemon. And um, so it also, it seems to have that adaptation. It's also one of those things where you read about generally like, this is how plants adapt to this. And then you see it and you can't ask the plant why it's doing that. So it's like, this seems to be why, um, why they have those adaptations. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to talk about grasses. So grasses have a couple of tools at their disposal to survive in these um, kind of extreme landscapes. So one is their root systems. So if you've ever seen um, some of those diagrams showing you know, the root systems of prairie plants, I have one <laughs> right on my desk where you see the, the above ground grass and then, you know, which is maybe like a foot tall and then there's three feet of roots. So a majority of the biomass of the grass is below ground and that allows them to access nutrients and also survive drought and survive the winter since most of these are uh, perennial. And so um, the leaves above ground will become dormant and all the resources for the plant will go below ground into the roots. Um, some grasses like blue grama grass also have some very shallow roots at the, um, just at the surface of the ground. And that allows them to access even the tiniest bit of rain that comes down in a drought um, and makes them a bit more drought resilient. And then the other tool that grasses have um, to deal with grazing is that their growing point, which is called the apical meristem, that's where new leaf tissue is coming from, is located at the base of the plant rather than at the top. So if a, um, a cow or a sheep or a bison or whoever comes along and chews off a piece of a leaf, um, that grass can still send up new leaves from that shoot uh, at the very bottom, rather than um, if the if that grazing animal had chewed off that growing point, then it wouldn't be able to keep growing. So um, it can be an issue if something is grazed really short that that growing point can be grazed. But in a, like a typical moderate grazing situation, um, a grass would continue to grow. Um, in the face of grazing, so pretty cool. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Brian to talk about, kind of zoom out a little bit and talk about some of the conservation work that we do here. All right, thanks, thanks Kelsey. And thanks everybody for taking time this evening to, to uh, participate in our conversation here. So I'm gonna just talk through part of our conservation work and then Kelsey's gonna jump back in again. And um, if you look at, at the map, this is obviously Montana and these are the places where the Nature Conservancy is working across the state. So Crown of the Continent and the Northwest part of the state, the High Divide Headwaters in the Southwest and then um, um, in the uh, Northern Great Plains portion of the state, we have sort of three large landscape areas that we work in. And if we, if we looked at um, the entirety of Eastern Montana, we're, we're really fortunate in the state that there's many other um, very intact um, and um, high conservation value areas 
in other parts of eastern Montana. Um, and the reason why we selected these areas is that um, they, they overlap, as Kelsey showed you earlier in our presentation, with some of those really high conservation values, especially for grassland birds. And we're really particularly interested in grassland birds, not just the Nature Conservancy, but a lot of different conservation organizations, because grassland birds have suffered the steepest decline of any avian assemblage in, in North America. So, um, you know, maintaining this breeding habitat um, in the Northern Great Plains, which Montana is the biggest contributor in the U.S., um, is really vital. Um, you know, looking at those migration and movement corridors are really key. Um, and then another really important reason about picking these places is that these are, are intact areas that are a mix of both native rangeland as well as farmland and hayland. And this is the location in the state where uh, there's still a lot of opportunity for those grasslands to be converted um, from, from grass into annual crop production. So some of those southeastern parts of the state, you know, more rough and rugged kind of country, not really farm ground down there per se, still high conservation value. So we, we look at these three landscapes and, and that top one to the right um, is Bitter Creek, um, which is named for the Bitter Creek Wilderness Study Area. And that, that crosses over into Saskatchewan and includes um, Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan, which is sort of the Northern end of, of um, the extent of, of a lot of mixed grass prairie now in Saskatchewan. Um, as you move further north in Saskatchewan, uh, better than 80% of Saskatchewan's prairies have been farmed. So um, Montana um, is really the base that keeps uh, the grassland systems in Saskatchewan sort of functioning and healthy. We're, we're actually feeding conservation benefits to the north. To the south of, of that Bitter Creek area, and, and I should mention that Bitter Creek's mostly a mixed grass system. Um, once you get into the Montana Glaciated Plains, that's a mixture of, of mixed grass prairie and sagebrush. One of the three most important places for uh, breeding greater sage grouse uh, in the U.S. Um, as far as density of, of males um, per, per square mile, um, by far the highest in Montana and, and uh, really an outstanding landscape and, and really kind of a unique mix where you'll be in mixed grass and then over the hill it's uh, sagebrush um, grassland. And then to the south of that is the Mussel Shell Plains, which is um, trending towards mostly a sagebrush system, but then has some really cool interspersions of, uh, of ponderosa pine woodland and savanna. Uh, kind of classic Missouri River breaks if you've uh, driven through um, uh, on across the highway there in, in the CMR um, contains that kind of country. So these, these landscapes all share overlaps with each other. They all share some species with each other um, and they, they all are somewhat different from each other. Interestingly, they're all three connected by pronghorn as, as uh, Kelsey mentioned. Um, uh, one of the longest land mammal migrations recorded was a pronghorn that started out north of Bitter Creek in Saskatchewan. And by the time her collar fell off uh, in the winter of 2011, she was um, um, uh, heading for the Yellowstone River. Um, so had, had um, uh, would have made ultimately a 450 mile or so round trip migration movement. Next slide, Kelsey. So as I mentioned before, these, these grasslands are um, in those three landscapes, those, those landscapes are about 50% or so uh, public land and 50% um, private land, just as a rule of thumb. And, and like I said, the, the big driver of change outside of uh, climate change, which is obviously gonna be the ultimate driver of change, you know, not only in grasslands, but across the globe, the, the big human caused land use change out there is, is really cropland conversion. And um, uh, one of the things that, that's really interesting is, you know, sometimes people ask me, why, why would things be converted now? Um, and kind of what's going on? 
One of the things that's really interesting with the um, uh, starting of in, in the about 2006 or so, they Congress passed the Renewable Fuel Standards, which really vastly expanded the amount of corn that we grow in the U.S., which sounds a little bit crazy. Um, but um, uh, the, and the reason for that was the ethanol mandate. So we now have ethanol in almost all of our gasoline. Um, and so that really drove up the price of corn and, and between the combination of price of corn um, and along, goes, along with corn goes soybeans. Um, uh, the, those are higher value crops than say uh, wheat is. Um, and so uh, GMOs have also come big onto the horizon for both corn and soybeans. So what's happened is the corn belt moved from the I states, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, uh, Southern Minnesota, places like that, and the very Eastern part of the Dakotas to now it's, if you drive on I-94 in North Dakota, you hit corn almost at the Montana border. Um, and as you drive across North Dakota, almost, uh, you know, the, a big percentage of North Dakota's farmland now is corn. And like I said, along with corn goes soybeans. And one of the really interesting things is that in 1980, there were zero acres of soybeans grown in North Dakota because there were no GMO so soybeans that could grow there. And the reason why I'm kind of going on and on and on about corn and soybeans is that if you don't grow wheat in North Dakota, which used to be the number one wheat growing state, well, you got to grow it somewhere. And so what happens is that corn and soybeans in the Dakotas pushes wheat west and south. So it comes to Montana, comes to parts of Wyoming, um, really pushes down into, into western Kansas, um, into other drier regions in the Great Plains. And so what we've seen with this uh, change in agriculture is that um, um, we, we've seen sort of a second kind of big breakout in grasslands. Uh, so there's the initial homesteading, a bunch of grass went back onto the landscape in the 30s and, and 40s. And now there's sort of a continuous kind of uh, change that's occurring out there. And just in average across the Northern Great Plains, World Wildlife Fund has, has documented that we lose on average about a million acres of grasslands a year, not all that is native. So that's former conservation reserve program lands, but um, we're losing about a million acres of grasslands a year. And you can see like in this top left photo, I, I photographed this, uh, that photos from 2012, wheat prices were, were super high and they just scraped the topsoil with the rocks um, and, and windrowed the rocks at the edge of the field and busted out a, a quarter of a section. And, you know, some of our soils are really conducive to growing things, but because we are in a, in a, in a low precip area, uh, a, lot of, a lot of that north central part of the state is 10 to 14 inches. And we have a lot of wind erosion. If, uh, if uh, you had 78 mile an hour winds here in, at my house last night um, and we can move a lot of soil really quickly and you know all that dust bowl image that um, uh, comes to mind is uh, you know still happens today I took that photo on the bottom left um, uh, in in April this year so um, and, and you can see in that map on the bottom right that um, uh, Montana South Dakota and parts of Wyoming are, are leaders unfortunately in loss of loss of grasslands Next slide, please. So what, what does that mean? So when we're, we're working in these landscapes and, and as Kelsey mentioned uh, about, um, you know, the vast majority of the private lands and most of the public lands are used for either farming, haying or livestock production. And so uh, our work is predicated on the idea of community-based conservation. So we're gonna work with the folks who live in in the landscape and, and um, while ranching with cattle is not equivalent to bison on the landscape, um, it does have a lot of the same um, ecological outcomes or you can drive those. So if you use rotational based grazing where you can concentrate livestock, graze for a period of time, move and, and keep those livestock moving, um, that's not exactly the way bison moved across the landscape, or at least the way we guess that they have. 
but it creates some outcomes that um, allows um, uh, good ecological outcomes that can sustain wildlife habitat, sustain native grasslands and, and the plant animal diversity out there. And our example of doing this is on our 60,000 acre mat or ranch property, which is located south of Malta where we run a grass bank. And what's unique about a grass bank is that we have 20 different ranches that operate on our mat or property. They all bring you know, um, cattle and all those cattle run in three different commingled cattle herds. So there's two different cow herds and one large yearling herd. Ranches generally bring anywhere from 100 to 200 animals. So just part of their ranch um, inventory of livestock. And what we do there is we charge people less than, than the full market rate um, for grazing on our property in exchange for conservation actions on their own home ranch. And so what we're trying to do is both uh, incentivize and reward people for good stewardship practices on, on their property. And we do that in a way so that uh, instead of paying $30 for a cow-calf pair to graze on the matador for a month, a landowner can get a reduced amount up to all the way up to $15. Um, but typically it's uh, discounted uh, somewhere between five to $8 off on, on a per AU animal unit month basis. And in this case, we manage the grazing, we set the grazing schedule, do that in a conversation every spring with our, with all of our grass bank members. Um, and then we uh, basically move those cattle across the ranch and the grass bank members do that. Um, we participate in that. And then we set ecological management outcome goals for every single one of those pastures that are on that map there. And, and uh, one of the really key parts of our, our management there is that we try to not graze any uh, native pasture um, at the same time year to year. And so basically what that means is that in any given year, our pastures in, in any given two year period of time, our pastures will have a growing season of rest. So the plants will complete most of their, if not all of their growth cycle um, before they're grazed again. And, and that allows for that healthy grassland system. And that's our discounts are, are predicated on those things as well as keeping prairie dogs out on the landscape, uh, not farming uh, their native rangelands. So if you ever break ground on your ranch um, and, and we monitor these things, um, on a grass bank ranch, then that ranch is forever out of the grass bank and, and can't come back in. And so the result is that now annually we're um, you know affecting management on our 60,000 acres that we that we manage, um, but we're also impacting another 300,000 acres on those grass bank ranches. Next slide, please. And so this is just a little bit of an idea of how it works. And in, in, in uh, Kelsey had talked about some of you know, the different plants and things. So in the foreground, you have this, you know, ungrazed, um, mostly uh, needle and thread, uh, a little bit of green needle grass mixed in there, half a dozen other different grass species. And if you look where the, the greener vegetation is at, where those yearlings are standing, uh, that's actually uh, on the edge of and, and in a prairie dog pound. So just a little bit further back, there's actually a fence that runs through there. There's a prairie dog town and, and those prairie dogs are on both sides of the fence. And one thing that we know about herbivory is that grazing animals always go to the greenest, most palatable forage. So interestingly, when we have cattle on the matador and it's May and June, the very first place they go to graze in any given pasture is where the prairie dog towns are at. Um, so we actually see this sort of symbiotic um, uh, connection between grazers and they, the, the cows sort of create an advantage for those prairie dogs by removing an excess um, uh, vegetation, which you know the prairie dogs are trying to keep the grass short. And then uh, by those cows grazing there, they're getting the most palatable, most nutritious um, um, vegetation. And that allows those prairie dog cows to expand and grow. So just, just one example of, of how we can manage grazing um, across, the, across these different uh, properties and across the matador. Next slide, please. So one of the other really key parts of our work um, is thinking about, well, how do we keep these grasslands intact? And this is just a, a, 
uh, two of the three uh, landscapes. Um, and uh, so when we uh, bought the Matador, um, it was a sort of a, a, a couple step process, but that on the left hand uh, map there on the left side, there's a green kind of squiggly polygon there. That's the Matador Ranch, which is both um, TNC um, owned property as well as some BLM and state uh, lease land. And then the, the orange that you see right next to it, and then a little bit to the right, were private lands that were under conservation easement. And so when you look in 2002 at the orange on the map, there's almost no orange out there. Um, and uh, the yellow color I should mention is Bureau of Land Management land. And then the, the, the lighter sort of uh, kind of just a little bit of an off-white. That's all the private land that's out there. So you can see within these landscapes, there are a mix of public and, and private lands and almost none of, of those private lands had had any conservation permanent protection on them in, in 2002. And if, if you then look over to the right, um, what you can see again is, you know, just give you a bearings, Matador again is in green on the left. Um, this is in 2020. And you can see other bits of green that's scattered in that Montana Glaciated Plains area. And then, then a great big area of green in that Bitter Creek area. And those are all nature conservancy conservation easements. So we've secured just short of 100,000 conservation easement acres and conservation easements in just over 10 years. Um, that um, uh, darker reddish orange is other conservation easements. Most of those are held by US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, uh, associated with protecting prairie pothole sort of habitat, which um, uh, is in this landscape as well. And then that kind of a little bit lighter orange, those are those grass bank ranches. So that's that 305,000 acres that are 300,000 acres every year that we bring in. And, and it's, it's a little bit difficult to tell, but you can see that there's actually some green that would overlap some of those grass bank ranches because we have been acquiring easements on grass bank ranches as we go. And so as a consequence in, in 2002, there was um, you know, less than, than 50,000 private land protected acres in that glaciated plains area. Um, now there's, there's well over 100,000 acres of private protected lands. Um, there's about 300,000 acres of tillable private lands. Um, so, but overall, about a third of those private lands now um, are protected from tillage. And if you look up into that Bitter Creek area, we secured um, just, just short of 56,000 acres in conservation easements there. One of the, the really cruel things about um, some of that work is that in the middle of that is, is the largest wilderness study area in the Great Plains. The Bitter Creek Wilderness Study Area is 62,000 acres or 61,000 acres. And, and we basically have put easements all the way around uh, almost the entirety of that now. And those, those easements are all no building, um, no power lines. Um, so um, by default, if you went and you looked out there today, the only thing that, that you will see is a big open landscape. Um, and that's the way it's gonna, gonna remain into the future. Um, and I, I guess one, one last piece on this is that one of the reasons why conservation easements have been working so well in these landscapes is that um, um, in large part, it helps ranches um, keep their ranch operations going, um, mostly in the opportunity to grow family ranches. So as people come in and out of the landscape um, and, and uh, you get multi-generation families out there, by, by acquiring easements on properties, it allows that next generation to either come onto the ranch or maybe um, basically the, the easement payment is more or less like the 401k payment for the parents. And so one of the really neat parts of, of this conservation story is the fact that it's also keeping a, a land use out there that's compatible and it's working sort of within the values of the community so that um, um, easements are went from being um, what one county commissioner told me in 2002 as state-sponsored socialism to now having a much more positive 
uh, view in the landscape and, and uh, continuing interest in easements as, as a tool for people in, in ranching. Next slide. Back to you, Kelsey. Yeah, I don't know why I had so much trouble changing between the slides there. So I just have a couple more slides to wrap up um, a couple of other conservation tools that are being used on the landscape. Um, so one of these is called the Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances. Total mouthful, but great program. <laughs> this is what I do a lot of my work on. And so these agreements are typically agreements between a private landowner and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, in this case, we have that agreement, but it's a programmatic agreement, which means we can enroll um, private landowners within our agreement. So the idea is to um, proactively address threats to species that could end up on the endangered species list. So this particular agreement that we have covers uh, those four grassland songbirds that I mentioned early on, as well as sage grouse. Um, and there's 12 threats that Fish and Wildlife Service identified. So things like um, habitat loss and fragmentation, noxious weeds, fences, haying. Um, and so we work with landowners to create management plans that address those. So for example, with um, fencing, it doesn't mean that they can't have fences, but that they work with us to make sure that they're not near a lek um, or that they're um, you know, just trying to minimize the harm that um, could be caused to those species. And then those landowners then get regulatory assurances that if those species end up on the endangered species list, um, they won't face additional regulations. So this is a great tool um, to address a number of threats. And um, these are 20 year agreements. So they're a bit shorter term, but still long enough to be making an impact. Um, Within those, we also work with private landowners on um, different types of um, on the ground stewardship projects. So um, the picture on the far left is a beaver dam analog that we worked with Pheasants Forever to put in on a property in Phillips County this summer. Um, so we're just starting to expand on that work. Um, this is something that the Nature Conservancy in Montana has been doing in Southwest Montana for a long time. And now we're expanding up here to improve the health of our um, riparian systems. And you know, this could easily be a presentation in and of itself about beavers and prairie streams and things like that. Um, and then we also have worked on some grassland restoration projects, um, which is typically taking some of that marginal crop ground where people aren't getting a very good economic return. They're usually highly erodible soils and planting them back to native grasses and forbs. And so that's always really rewarding because, you know, where we have this trend of sometimes we're losing habitat, this is a nice way to reverse that trend and actually um, recreate habitat. Um, and we work closely on these projects with Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as a number of other partners through um, two uh, local rancher led groups. So there's the Rancher Stewardship Alliance and Winnet ACES, which are based in Malta and Winnet respectively. And both of these groups have created conservation committees that bring together some of the local conservation groups and agencies that are involved in the area. And um, they have applied for grants and sometimes the partners are also able to bring funding to the table. And so this is a way that we can um, sometimes get some of those projects funded. Um, one of the big focuses that Ranchard Stewardship Alliance has had has been um, putting grazing systems like grazing infrastructure on conservation reserve program land that has um, expired. So like Brian was mentioning, that land is often at risk of being converted back to crop ground. Um, and so by making it, um, giving that economic boost, making it available for grazing, um, it makes it less likely that in the long term that would that we would lose that grassland. And um, you know, it seems to be a model that's working where it's benefiting conservation, but also benefiting the communities. And so I feel like this quote, quote's a little cheesy, but I always think it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, we, we don't work alone, we don't work in a bubble. And so, you know, conservation, you have to have that 
that background of we all appreciate and have concern for the natural resources, which is where all those pretty flower pictures come into play. But it's also important that we work with the local communities um, and we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to get much done if we weren't able to work with other people. And so you like those maps that Brian showed, those are over the course, course of 20 years. So if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And then I just wanted to end with this slide because um, people often ask me for, um, you know, what references I use when I'm in the field. And um, so I just thought I'd throw this out here as a, a couple things to wrap it up. So um, I really enjoy the Grasses of Saskatchewan book. <laughs> there's also a Wyoming Grasses book. Um, there's just a lot of overlap between Saskatchewan and Wyoming and Montana. The grassland plants of South Dakota and the Northern Great Plains, probably about half of those species are found, um, at least in Phillips County, where I am. Um, and then those websites, so there's the Montana Natural Heritage Program. If you guys aren't familiar with it, they have a pretty extensive field guide. The um, Saskatchewan Wildflower website is my favorite website ever. Sometimes I just go look at it for fun. There's great photos and great ID information and a lot of overlap with our species here. And then that Montana Wildflower app, if any of you have a smartphone, this is literally the only app I will ever recommend to someone. I don't, I don't like apps, but this one <laughs> is free. And it, you can put in like um, the county you're in, the time of year you saw something, how many petals the flower had, whatever information you have, and it will give you a list of potential species. So it's not necessarily gonna tell you what it is, but it can help you narrow it down. Um, so that can be um, helpful, especially if you're getting into it. So I just wanted to provide that. Also, if anyone reaches out to me, um, I have like countless uh, other PDFs and guides and stuff that I can send you for Grassland ID. So yeah, that's all we have. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk tonight.